Okay, so this morning, the opening prayer, the collect, uh, had the phrase, prepare the way for our salvation. And then we read from Isaiah, a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then later, Mark's gospel, that same passage from Isaiah, I'm sending a messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way for you. That's about John the Baptist. So, do you sense a theme going on this morning? Yeah, good. You're awake. Y'all have all had your coffee. Good. Prepare the way of the Lord. That sounds great, but why? why? Why does God need somebody to prepare the way? I mean, wouldn't the Messiah just having this, like, superpower be enough? Shouldn't God just say, snap, it's all done. It's probably what I would do if I was God, which is a really scary thought, um, right? God is not a genie. We all love the movie Aladdin, great movie. Not a genie. You don't just, we can try this. Now, you might have tried to look at God as a genie, right? You say the prayers, you want, you say, oh God, you know, if I do this, then I want that to happen. Uh, but often in our experience, life doesn't work like that, and God often doesn't work how we expect. So, who prepared the way for Jesus? Well, here's a list on this slide. Just in Luke's gospel, just one gospel, uh, there's a few people. We've got John the Baptist, and we've got uh, Mary, and we've got Joseph, and Simeon, and Anna, and Zachariah, and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's parents, shepherds, and angels, and so forth. We could go on and on and on. Sure seems like a lot of people to prepare the way. So if the Messiah needed help, how much more do we need help? Getting through the struggles and the challenges of our lives, how much more do we need help? But, and this is a really tough question, and I, this is, uh, some, they say every sermon is a little bit preaching to yourself, and this is very true. Are you willing to ask for help? I don't know about you, but I find it's much easier to help somebody than it is to ask for help. And my experience has been like 99% of people are the same way. It's very difficult to ask for help. But yet, in, in the beginning of the gospel, we're hearing about how the Messiah needed help from others. So, this morning I want to give you a little overview of Mark's gospel. Um, there was a church, there's a church calendar uh, follows this cycle, uh, six, sort of six seasons, starting with Advent. So we're at the beginning of the church year, four, week, uh, four weeks of Advent, then we go to Christmas and uh, and, and then Epiphany and Lent and Easter and Pentecost. You don't need to, I know you have this memorized, so we don't need to get into that. And so the church creatively made the, named these year A, B, and C. How great, you know, very creative, the church people. So we are in year B right now. We are starting a year, and this is, um, I, this is important. The Gospels in year A, which we just finished, are often Matthew, and then in year B is often Mark. So that's this year. We spend a lot of time in Mark's gospel. Uh, often Luke in year C. John is very different, so it's in all, the, all four. Now, you'll hear readings from all four gospels throughout the year, but I wanted to spend a little time today on Mark because you'll hear a lot of readings from Mark's gospel in the next, next year. So prepare the way to explore Mark's gospel. Not real exciting, I know, but that's, that's what we're going to do today. Okay, first I want to start off with a little story. Now, if you look at that, sl that picture, uh, the little girl on the left-hand side is, is my daughter, Faith, my youngest. Yay! There she is! With her cousin, Ivy, okay? And at that time, Faith was three years old. And, and anyway, here's what happened. She was actually, it was actually the day that this story takes place. She's wearing a fairy outfit with wings. Now, this was the same day that my wife, Beth Ann, was ordained. It, and so she, in the Episcopal Church, you're ordained as a deacon, then a priest. She was a, it was her deacon ordination at the cathedral. So there's a picture on that same day. So because it was still COVID protocols and all those things, we said, you know, why don't, why doesn't my mom who lives in Sugarland watch all the girls? Because my, br my brother, their family at the time lived in Saudi Arabia. And that's the four of them, my, my big brother, Mike, uh, his wife, Jen, uh, Maya, and Ivy, their daughters. And so we thought this would be perfect. You know, our girls will go join their girls, and we'll have a good time. So we're at the ordination, and we don't know any of this till later. Faith sees my brother. Now, she's really never met him. She was a baby, perhaps, for the last time, been a long time. 
And she's scared and confused because he looks like me, right? Looks kind of like me. Sounds like me, but he is definitely not me. <laughs> so what do you do in your three, in your three? She's scared. So she goes and she hides really well. Uh, in my inter introduction video uh, a couple months ago, I told you that she's a great hider. That is an understatement. There have been moments of panic that my wife and I have found where she hides and hides and hides. And so, uh, and she loves it. She just hams it up. She thinks it's the best thing ever, but it's pretty scary to us. So anyway, she hides really well. So well that the entire house was looking for her. The police had to be called because they have looked up and down in the attic, every nook and cranny, nobody can find Faith. And they're afraid that she might have run away somewhere, run off, and, and nobody knows what to do. And so that, was a, that must have been a really interesting call um, because my brother makes a phone call and the police say, well, can you describe the person? Yeah, she's three years old and wearing a fairy costume with wings. Probably the only time they've ever heard that one. And then... So, so sure enough, they look and they look and they look. They can't find her. It's been over 30 minutes or so has gone by. And then finally they hear a little tear, a sad little crying. And sure enough, they realized that Faith was hiding in the closet, like under all the clothes. They had checked that closet twice already, had not found her. And, she, and they finally, you know, cuddled her, and she was found, and everything was happy. And in fact, uh, we have a picture that's the same day. Uh, they finally found faith, and everybody was relieved. And it sort of uh, reminds me of Jesus in the temple, right? You know, Jesus, the 12-year-old, whenever he was lost. And so I tell that story for a few reasons. Uh, one, practical. Um, if my kid is missing, it's that one, and I want your help. So if Sunday after church, you know, you see a child randomly hiding under a pew, it's probably mine. Just please return to owner. That would be great. Uh, to the parent. So that's one, and she'll find lots of ways. That's, but the second reason is actually connects to Mark's gospel. You see, faith hid herself. And as you read Mark's gospel, you will find the identity of Jesus is also hidden. You see, Jesus doesn't come out in Mark's gospel and start announcing everything. We, we heard the very beginning of Mark um, today, and, and Mark tells us that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, right? But Jesus doesn't actually do that. He actually, the beginning of Mark, starts healing and then saying, please keep that a secret. Don't tell anybody. And so this secret is sometimes called uh, the messianic secret. He's the Messiah. It's, you know, it's, it's the sort of biblical uh, language for that. And so it's a secret. And so why would Jesus keep this a secret? Why would, I mean, you know, once again, you'd think Jesus would be like, hey, you know, I'm the Messiah. You found me. Here I am. You know, follow me. You'd think that would be the easier path. Um, there's a lot of reasons, possible reasons Here's the thing about theology. If we don't know the answer, we just give you lots of possibilities. That's that, kind of your secret here. Um, crowd control. So when Jesus healed somebody early in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, he heals this guy and he says, be really quiet. And the guy's like, okay, Jesus, I'm healed. I'm going to tell everybody I know. And he does the opposite of what Jesus says. And then what ends up happening is the crowds are so big that Jesus can't even go into the town. And so crowd control was a real problem that they had to deal with. Um, and Jesus traveled all the time. And so crowd control is possibly one reason. Um, another is theological. Um, in Mark's gospel, unlike, say, John, the identity of Jesus is kind of understood later. So the, the idea in Mark is that maybe uh, his true identity was only occurred or happened later in, in Mark. It's a debate, but I'm just kind of telling you there because it's a theological. And the third, and I think a practical reason, is dramatic. So one of the things that's so important to know about the Gospels, we have them all in writing, but they were originally spoken. It was a drama. It was a play. I know we have some theater people here. It was performed. You can actually, I've actually seen this myself. They have people who have memorized all of Mark's gospel. One person can tell you the good news of Jesus Christ in Mark, all 16 chapters. Incredible feat, right? But if you actually listen to somebody tell it, it makes sense. And so the reason why that might be a secret is because in Mark's gospel, you, the audience, know right away, hey, this is who Jesus really is. 
but none of the other people who meet Jesus in the gospel do. And so it's kind of the wink to the audience, right? I think they call that the fourth wall or something in, in uh, you know, movies and so forth. So it's kind of another reason why that might be. So there's a lot of possible reasons. Um, so let's talk about Mark's vision of Jesus. So one thing to know is Jesus is misunderstood all the time. And he's a suffering servant. The book of Isaiah that we earlier quoted has a long chapter is devoted to this idea of a suffering servant uh, and, and who is the Messiah. He's also ironically understood by evil spirits and outsiders. So the last people you'd ever think to get it, get it. And the insiders don't get it, right? Jesus is a strong, silent type in Mark. He actually doesn't say a lot, but there's a lot of actions, a lot of healings, a lot of power. Um, and the disciples frequently misunderstand Jesus. They just get it wrong over and over and over again. And, and, and so that's another thing to know. It's filled with action immediately is Mark's favorite word. That word occurs over 40 times. So Jesus heals somebody, immediately he goes here, and he does this, and immediately. There's action, there's drama, it happens fast. And so those are a few themes in Mark. Who wrote Mark's gospel? We don't know. It was most, most of the uh, gospels, we just kind of give them an association. Uh, traditionally, John Mark, a companion of Paul and Barnabas is attributed. Uh, but for shorthand, it's just easier to say Mark than it is to say somebody wrote this a long time ago. We don't know who it is. Uh, it's just easier to say Mark. Um, so it's just a, it's more just uh, style. It, in terms of it really doesn't matter uh, too much. And in the ancient world, writing was often done with multiple people at the same time. That was pretty common. So it, it, we wouldn't think of it today like we do writing a book. Um, likely written between 66 and 70 AD, so that was just before a uh, temple fell, uh, that is in, um, and so that's, that's um, 66 to 70, and then it's the shortest gospel. I mentioned it was 16 chapters. Um, you can read it in about an hour. It's not very long. It's written in Greek to a largely non-Jewish audience. Why does that matter? Well, we, or how do we know that, first off? Um, we know that because um, they'll occasionally translate Aramaic words. And so if they didn't speak Aramaic, they, well, many Jews in certain areas spoke Aramaic, and so they translate to Greek. And it's a non-Jewish audience because in Mark's gospel, they tell you, um, this is what this Jewish practice is. And if they were a whole group of Jewish people, they would have known and understood those practices. Um, and so that's the same way why we don't explain customs that we're all familiar with, right? So um, that's kind of how, what, we, what we know about Mark. Um, as I mentioned, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that's your peek into who Jesus is. And then throughout the gospel, misunderstanding after misunderstanding, Jesus says something amazing, nobody quite gets it. And then near the very end, one chapter from the end, a centurion says, truly this man was God's son. And so we've only heard that theme of God's son one other time by an evil spirit in Mark's gospel. It doesn't occur very often. Uh, but what's fascinating about that is a centurion was like the last person you'd ever expect to understand the truth of Jesus. A centurion, remember, was a soldier, right? It was a soldier. Uh, you get the term century from century 100. Uh, they, they, were they were in charge of 100 soldiers, although technically it's really 80, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the whole idea was they were a soldier with authority that was, and remember, the Romans were occupying Israel. So these are not their friends. These are their enemy military people that they don't really want there. And yet, the last person on earth you could imagine gets it, who Jesus is. And so to me, that's a hopeful message, isn't it? Isn't it? Some of us get it right away, and some of us are a little slower. You know, sometimes we don't quite get it. But God is patient. God is teaching us all the time that sometimes it takes us a little longer to get the truth. So, if you read Mark, you're going to notice at the very beginning, everything is good. Jesus rises in popularity. He teaches with authority. He amazes people. The crowds say all kinds of amazing things like, we've never seen anything like this. You know, it's amazing. The religious leaders, though, they don't really like all that change. You know, Jesus is kind of shaking things up, and, and they didn't really care for that. But overall, you know, let the good times roll would be the theme of the first eight chapters. And then there is a shift. The last half of Mark, Jesus loses followers. In Jerusalem, he's rejected. He's uh, denied, um, betrayed, 
on trial and crucified. And, and what happens in the middle is a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. They, he's, you know, they understand. Peter says, you're the Messiah and awesome. But the problem was the disciples thought being the Messiah meant everybody's going to come and serve us. We're just going to sit on our throne. We're going to kick back and have it easy. They wanted the easy life. But Jesus says, no, you want to follow me? Come grab your cross and die. Suffer. Serve others. Be a servant of all. And so they got that he was the Messiah. They just didn't understand in the right way. And so if we read Mark, we're going to see a rise to popularity, then a fall. And there's a surprise ending. So the, uh, Mark famously ends with uh, the women seeing uh, the empty tomb and they run and they don't tell anybody. But if you've ever like watched movies, you ever heard of alternative endings, you know, you kind of see those. Well, in the Bible, the Bible invented that. We've had those long before Hollywood, okay? What, there's another ending in Mark's gospel, uh, likely written by other people much later, uh, and they weren't satisfied with the first one. What's, what's kind of fun, though, it, it, I think is, I've been talking about beginnings and endings a lot. Uh, the the last, second ending of Mark's gospel ends with the word, Amen. And it begins, of course, with the beginning of the good news. Just like the Bible itself begins with, in the beginning, a Genesis, and the last word of Revelation is amen. So from the beginning to the end, we have God's presence with us. So I just wanted to give you all that preview of Mark's gospel because we'll be spending so much time with it. Um, I pray that we can learn to ask for help um, from others, that we can rely upon one another, and that we can, uh, we can more deeply appreciate the good news of God in Jesus. Amen.